For our next panel, we're going to be returning to this question of employee independent contractor classification. Um, and we're very fortunate to have as our moderator for this panel, uh, Mowers Student Bar Association president and my good friend, Aaron Vance. So Aaron, take it away. What a wonderful intro. He makes me feel much more important than I actually am. Um, but it is such a joy to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, as been said, my name is Aaron Vance, and I am a third-year law student here at Mauer and the student bar president. Uh, I will just say that after graduation, I'm going to be joining the labor and employment group with a firm back home, and so it really is a delight to be here moderating this panel today on employees, independent contractors, and the issue of worker misclassification. So I'm especially excited to hear what our panelists have to say in regard to the impact of these you know, real pressing social issues and the kind of legislation that underscores these tensions that exist at the intersection of corporate interests, labor rights, and the realities of being an employee in the 21st century. So before I cut them loose to provide their own introductory remarks and thoughts, I will give a brief introduction of the three of them today. So you all have already heard from Professor Vina Dubal, but for a little background, Professor Dubal's research focuses on the intersection of law, technology, and precarious work. Within these broad frames, she uses empirical methodologies and critical theory to understand the impact of digital technologies and emerging legal frameworks and how they impact the lives of workers. Professor Dubal has been cited by the California Supreme Court, and her scholarship has been published in top-tier law review and peer-reviewed journals, including the California Law Review, the Wisconsin Law Review, the Berkeley Journal of Empirical and Labor Law, and Perspectives on Politics. Professor Dubal joined the Hastings faculty in 2015 after a postdoctoral fellowship at Stanford University, which is also her undergraduate alma mater, and prior to that, she received her JD and PhD from UC Berkeley where, as you heard earlier, conducted an ethnography on the San Francisco tax industry. The subject of her doctoral research arose from her work as a public interest attorney and Berkeley Law Foundation fellow. Our next panelist is Professor Ken Dauschmidt, who, aside from being my employment professor, <laughs> and uh, we like to call President Dauschmidt, uh, is a nationally recognized teacher and scholar in labor and employment law, and, it, and in specifically in the economic analysis of the legal problems in labor and employment. Amongst Professor Dauschmidt's research are gender and representation in the law, career satisfaction in the law, and various aspects of the gig economy. He's the author of seven books and numerous articles on labor and employment, the economic analysis of law, and frequently presents papers at academic conferences, really across the world. His innovative teaching methods which, you know, involve strikes and, you know, making his students despise him for a semester, have been widely featured in publications including the Christian Science Monitor, the Chronicle of Higher Education, the Sun-Times, the National Jurist, and local papers. He received his bachelor's from Wisconsin, a master's, a JD, and PhD from the University of Michigan. And our final panelist is Leanna Katz, who is an LLM candidate at Harvard Law School. Katz earned her JD at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law after obtaining her bachelor's at McMaster University. Prior to starting her LLM at Harvard, Katz has had multiple clerkships with the Court of Appeal for British Columbia, the Supreme Court of Canada, and Sullivan and Cromwell. Her own research interests are in labor and employment and feminist legal thought, with her current research focusing on comparing labor and employment law in Canada and the United States with a specific perspective on Ontario and California. Her research also includes exploring the relationships between the gig economy and work traditionally done by women. So following that, following that introduction, I will turn it over to our panelists for some brief remarks and introductions. Uh, and we will start with Professor Duval, who has prepared PowerPoint. Thank you so much, Aaron. Where's home? Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, that's right. Your accent sounds so familiar. I think Ben told me that I'm also from Kentucky. Somehow, I think I just might spent the, my entire childhood watching TV <laughs> and didn't, didn't pick up an accent. 
Um, so what, how many of you were here for my, uh, for my talk earlier? Okay, I'm just wondering how much I should go over AB5. Um, but just very quickly, this is a slide that you saw before. Very recently in California, this law, AB5, passed, um, which essentially re is a reformulation of the test for employment status, um, makes it much harder, although not impossible, for companies to uh, misclassify their workers as independent contractors. Um, so I was surprised by the gusto with which drivers and driver groups in California um, have embraced AB5 and employment status. Um, and by the lack of divisive discussion and debate uh, in the workforce, both in private and in public, because um, I, I am doing an ethnography of drivers groups, and there just wasn't a lot of debate on whether or not drivers should support this law. Um, and the reason I was surprised was that existing survey research, including my own, suggests that the majority of Uber drivers have a preference for independent contract contractor status. And with this in mind, I had a series of questions. Um, in examining my data, I, including a survey and sort of years of, of, of field notes and qualitative interviews, I wanted to know how can we explain the discrepancy between drivers' stated preferences for independent contractor status on surveys and, um, and their advocacy for employment status um, how do, do Uber drivers make sense of employee status in relationship to their lives and visions for the future of work? And how might understanding these perspectives inform how regulators approach worker status in the tech-enabled gig economy? So to date, the most influential scholarship on Uber driver preference is a 2017 piece written by eminent economists Jonathan Hall and Alan Kruger. So Hall and Kruger concluded, based on survey research paid for by Uber, that roughly 79% of U.S. Uber drivers preferred independent contractor status to employee status. And the data has been cited in a variety of regulatory contexts to, to deter employment regulations. I myself have heard regulators cite to this uh, specific study more than a dozen times. So the specific question that Hall and Kruger asked was, which of the following would you most prefer regarding your driving with Uber? Being classified as an employee of Uber so you could be eligible for a minimum wage, health care, and other benefits, but you would not have the flexibility to set your own schedule, or being classified as an independent contractor for Uber so you would have the flexibility to set your own schedule, but you are not eligible for a minimum wage, health care, or other benefits. Now the question you'll note is double-barreled, does not reflect good survey practices, forcing respondents to answer two questions at once um, instead of uh, giving, asking them a, a single question because their opinions on the two might diverge. Um, drawing on a critique of two ILO scholars, I also argue that this question obfuscates the law and does the cultural work of creating a legal misperception among survey respondents. So although many employees in the U.S. have an inflexible schedule, employee status is not fundamentally incompatible with scheduling flexibility as the question as framed appears to claim. And there are many reasons, which I'm happy to talk, to, talk about in the Q&A, why we would not expect companies to clamp down on flexibility in this particular um, economy. So... Um, in developing my own survey instrument administered to San Francisco Uber drivers between February and August of 2016, respondents were asked in binary terms whether they preferred to be an employee or independent contractor, and they weren't given any information on what that entailed. But the findings were similar um, to the Hall and Kruger study. Most drivers preferred the independent contractor classification, and this was true for immigrant drivers, non-immigrant drivers, women, men, full-time part-time across the board. So um, if regulators take the position that driver preference matters, that the law should to some extent reflect the desires and perspectives of those it's intended to serve, then the survey data seems to indicate that labor, the labor platform companies like Uber and Lyft should be allowed to operate um, operate treating their workers as independent contractors and that employment and labor laws should accommodate their business models. But and in fact, in several states, it already has done that. Um, but driver and driver groups rallied around AB5, which raises the question that drives this particular um, article that I've written, which is why. 
So after coding and analyzing my years of field notes and interview transcriptions for perspectives on employee status, I found that my ethnographic research project troubled the survey numbers um, and, and generally the practice of determining complicated prefer preferences through an efficient survey medium. Um, <coughs> based on driver narratives drawn from interviews and ethnographic da data, I argued that the survey findings capture not attitudinal realities or desires, but in many cases driver perceptions rooted in fear. So in the context of their relative powerlessness and economic reliance on Uber, employee status was subjectively constructed through a duality. It was both a desirable way to fight back against the company and a status that came with its own undesirable uncertainties, including, most critically, the potential loss of flexibility. Worker narratives overwhelmingly suggested that drivers had an ambivalent relationship to the employee identity. So in making sense of these legal categories, which you'll, you'll note have been perplexing even for law professors and judges to parse, Uber drivers said they unequivocally needed and wanted the protections and benefits that employee status had to offer. But many were afraid of what a company like Uber would do if they embraced their role as employer. Drivers had a strong sense of the structural and instrumental power of Uber. Their ambivalence was fueled by what a terrible employer Uber could be, how Uber would never agree to an employment model, and anxieties that the company would take away their flexibility, not because employee status necessitates a shift schedule, but just because they could. Gladys's perspective on employee status, for example, embodied all of these concerns. Gladys, a 50-year-old immigrant from Venezuela, began driving for Uber in March 2015. She had previously co-owned a small company with her ex-husband, and after the, the divorce, she was out of work and without an income. She couldn't hold a steady job because of a medical need to take frequent and unpredictable rest breaks. Gladys was involved in a driver-led organization when I met her, and she had officially objected to a proposed settlement in the class action against Uber. She told me she didn't want the settlement money from Uber. She wanted to be an Uber employee. But every now and again, Gladys would divulge her fears about the employee classification she was fighting for. In one, in one conversation, she told me, of course I want to be an employee. But on the other hand, I think, how would I be treated by Tra Tra Travis Kalanick as him being my employer? He would have a whip on us. What is he going to do to me as an employee? I know he's capable of many things. This man is an awful man, awful to the point that I think he's a sociopath. And to have so many people feeding families in the hands of a sociopath is bad. Uber is ruthless to their software engineers. Imagine what they would do to us. So on the one hand, all of Gladys's organizing efforts had been oriented around achieving employment status. On the other, she was plagued by concerns about what working conditions she would have to endure if Uber was her employer. She already felt exploited by the company and disrespected by executives. But without access to company managers, a human relations department, or even accountable regulators, Gladys funneled her fury to Uber's Achilles heel, how they classified their drivers. Like other drivers in my ethnography, Gladys also frequently alluded to the company's structural power, the amount of venture capital money behind, Uber, uh, behind the company's influential political connections. My interlocutors regularly sent and send emails and texts with links to articles discussing investments in Uber or comments by prominent politicians supporting the company for its innovation and job creation. For the senders, these messages were evidence that the company was engaged in unscrupulous graft. They are lining lawmakers' pockets, was a sentiment that I heard here often from Gladys and others. Many believed that the company was actually involved in illegal bribes, but most were alluding to the instrumental power of the company in their deliberate and successful political engagement. Uber, they believed, had so much power in the regulatory arena that no matter what, the company could not be forced to recognize their drivers as employees. For example, Rusty, a Filipino-American immigrant driver, felt there was no way Uber would give him basic employee benefits no matter what the law and the regulators said. Like many migrant drivers in California, Rusty drove up from his home in Orange County to San Francisco for work because the rates were higher than in Southern California. In the context of how much he could benefit from employee benefits, he described his migrant work life to me. 
for most of the day. I stay in my car, living in my car. I'll have a curtain that I'll use to sleep. And then there are the days I would be able to get a bath, but there are times when I'm not going to be able to take a bath for two or three days. Then you sleep in your car, and as soon as you get up, you start driving. It's, it's really terrible. I'm far from my family. Rusty wanted the benefits associated with employment, but he chose independent contractor status on our survey. In one of my interviews with him, he clarified that his preference was based on what he thought was most realistic. Over the phone, after returning home to the OC, he further explained his thoughts on employment. It will be great if they make us employees, but I don't think Uber will. They're very smart and very shrewd and very greedy. They're not going, going to go for it ever because they make money out of this kind of system that they have right now, where I have to sleep in my car. Why would they change things? The law bends for them. Rusty's assessment and his reason for stating a preference for independent con contractor status were actually quite well informed, but they did not reflect a rejection of employment benefits, only a realistic assessment of the company's power. Why fight for this, he said. We will never win. Rather than being clear-cut, Gladys and Rusty's perspectives on employee status are fueled by an ambivalence generated from fears that the company could act with impunity. Unlike judges or lawyers applying a legal test, drivers took into account the external influences that might impact their lives beyond the obvious benefits of the status. In addition to their feelings of powerlessness in relationship to Uber, the ambivalence that a majority of drivers harbored toward employee status also stemmed from the necessity of scheduling flexibility in their lives. Whether they led transnational lives, endured disabilities that made a shift schedule impossible, or were responsible to and for young children, flexibility for work was not just a desire, it was a requirement. Contextualizing the need for scheduling flexibility and the ways in which it is conflated in driver narratives with the independent contractor classification also helps to explain and undermine the survey data. For example, Paul, a white 25-year-old internal migrant from Pikeville, a poor mining town in, uh, in Kentucky, had indicated in the survey that he didn't want to be an employee of Uber. When, when over tea at a cafe in San Francisco, I asked him again why, he answered, well, maybe not me personally, because eventually I'd like to move on to another job, but it would be nice to have like paid time off though. But at the same rate, Uber's a horrible company. If they did have us as employees, they may be a lot more strict in terms of customer feedback. Maybe if a customer gave really bad feedback, they may fire us. Paul's answer is much more complicated than represented in the survey. On the one hand, Paul wants the protections associated with employee status. Specifically, he wants to be able to take paid time off. Suffering from a mental illness that presents sporadically, Paul was, on unpredictable days, incapable of working. He wants in income protection during those times. That, he noted, would be one positive aspect of being an employee. But like Gladys and Rusty, he was afraid that if Uber were his employer, he would be even more at the whim and whimsy of the company, who might fire him based on a single customer's feedback. So what implications do these narratives of driver ambivalence have for gig worker regulation? While companies have tried to frame the debate about safety protections for platform workers around whether or not workers want employee status, I argue that this is the wrong question for regulators to consider, both because of the misconceptions that people have about what employment entails and because of the ability of businesses to shape how workers think about these categories. For example, in the wake of AB5, gig companies have capitalized off the needs of drivers who cannot work a rigid shift schedule to both misinform them through the app of the law's requirements and to mobilize fears against employment status. A better inquiry for regulators, then, is what kinds of safety net protections do today's labor platform workers need? Rather than limiting the regime of employment rights for gig workers, regulators might consider extending the scope of employee rights to include scheduling flexibility and defining compensable time for platform workers. And I can talk a little bit more about, about why compensable time is important in the Q&A. Something that the gig companies proposed in a last-ditch ditch attempt in early September to create a carve-out in AB5 for themselves was actually instructive on this point. They proposed legislation that had excellent language to help regulators think about how to legally inscribe scheduling flexibility for their workers. This comes from um, 
uh, a draft of their legislation that was, that was leaked to me. Um, so as we think about the future of app-based platform work, my research <coughs> underscores two important lessons. One, despite what survey research seems to indicate, workers need and want the basic employment benefits that offline workers enjoy. And two, the nature of app-based work gives regulators the opportunity to grow instead of to limit these benefits to account for the realities of both post-industrial service work and the complicated lives of today's workers. And in fact, there, are now, there is now some movement um, uh, to get uh, a wage order in California or based on this article um, around uh, flexibility in the app-based economy. So I contend that we think about app-based service work and regulating the future of work more broadly. We must take seriously that many workers need safety net benefits and control over when they work and that companies have the technological capacity to meet these needs. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Duball. It's always like a miniature homecoming when you find another Kentucky and not in Kentucky. Oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> That's how when Paul and I started talking, I was like, oh my god, you're from, from Pikeville. It formed a, a long bond between us. Are you, where, where are you originally from? Lexington. Lexington? Well, I won't hold that against you. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Dowschmidt. Should I come up there? Your choice. You welcome to stay? Up. I'll stand. It's always good to move around. Uh, hi. Uh, very, very pleased to be asked to speak today. I, this is a subject that I have talked about a fair amount lately, actually in China. Uh, I gave presentations on, on the new uh, gig economy and, and uh, the definition of employee, employees and independent contractors at, uh, uh, at a number of places in my most recent trip. Um, basically, um, and I, I give this, uh, well, I've talked about this with my students in my class. Uh, basically, within the work relationship or the employment relationship, we won't presume it's an employment relationship, just within the work relationship, we could regulate this entirely by contract. And the person who's doing the work for somebody else, the services to somebody else, all of their rights could be determined just by what they could bargain for and by what they could prove either in a written contract or an oral contract. And that would be, in some ways, a sensical, a sensical uh, solution to the problem. Society, however, has decided for a variety of reasons that that's not the way we should resolve this problem, at least not always the way. It is the dominant method in the United States, but because of information imperfections or because of public goods in the workplace or because of uh, inequality of bargaining power, society has decided that there should be certain basic rights in the workplace, and they have regulated with respect to this. So we have protective labor and employment regulation. We have the right to organize. We have workers' compensation. We have unemployment compensation. We have minimum wage. And and maximum hours regulation, all these regulations that go along with the workplace. And basically, it's a decision by society. We're going to intercede into this bargaining relationship and say that these are the certain minimums. And there's reasons why they, they do this. They don't want these costs to fall disproportionately on the employees, and they don't want these costs, uh, once the, if the employees fail in their ability to bear them, to fall on society. They want them borne by the work relationship itself that generates the profits. Now, in all of these statutes, the issue is does this work relationship fall under the statute? In other words, is this an, if it's an employment law, it'll have a definition of employee, who's covered, and the question is, is whether they are, uh, the worker is under that definition or not. And usually the distinction is between employees and independent contractors for anybody who's being paid. You could wonder whether somebody is an employee or a volunteer or if somebody is an employee or a student intern. Uh, those are other distinctions you can make, but at least for people who are being paid, the primary, the game is, are these people, quote unquote, employees or independent contractors? And when you look at employment regulation and, and labor regulation, the actual guiding words of the statutes are usually disappointing. They give, they give some direction, they have some general uh, provision. Uh, the, the, um, uh, in the National Labor Relations Act, the definition of employee is an employee of any employer and doesn't have to be an employee of a particular employer. Not a lot of direction. There are some specific exemptions and, and, and inclusions later that give you a little bit, but, but that's not uncommon. You get a self-referential definition that refers once again back to employees. And the way the courts have dealt with this problem is they have developed basically three different tests. There's the right to control test, which they borrowed from tort agency. And under that test, the burden is on the party that's trying to prove that they're an employee, either the government or the, or the, the, the person themselves. The burden is on them to show 
uh, and it's a totality of the circumstances test. We're going to look at a variety of factors. I think Vina had one formulation of a, this this morning, and you had 11 factors. Different jurisdictions formulate it differently, but it's usually about a dozen factors, such as, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, skill of the employee, whether they provide their own tools, all, all these things to try to look at. But, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at does the contractor have the right to control, all right? And as I said, this comes out of tort law, which becomes relevant later, but people just kind of – uh, courts adopted this into, into uh, how they were going to interpret these statutes. Another test, since this, since this test was not clearly not appropriate for some employment statutes, is the economic realities test. And so later on, with the, uh, with the um, New Deal, federal government passed protective legislation, it was pretty clear that they wanted it to apply more broadly than the traditional common law test, and also that it was aimed at protecting, quote-unquote, dependent people. So you get a minimum wage if you're economically dependent. And there, the, the economic realities test they've come up with is, once again, the burden is on the moving party, the, the employee, or the government to prove by a totality of the circumstances, we look at another long laundry list of factors, which looks a lot like the laundry list of factors for the right to control test. But now we look at it for the purposes of determining, are you economically dependent? Okay, And the idea is this fits the minimum wage better because the purpose of the statute is to protect people who are economically dependent, all right? The final test, the ABC test, which is actually older than people give it credit for. If you research it, you find out that Wisconsin was the first uh, state to come up with the ABC test back in the 1930s under their unemployment compensation statutes. But it's become much more popular lately, uh, and it's, it's been popular with state, more popular state legislatures and even with state courts now. But under this test... We're going to determine whether somebody's an employee. Uh, it, now, the burden is on the contractor, the employer, to show no longer totality of the circumstances test. They have to show all three factors, and I could go through the factors if you want, but basically the factors, they have to show both that the person is not controlled and not dependent in order for them not to be an employee, all right? Uh, and... Um, why are states moving towards this solution for this universal problem of defining who's covered by this protective legislation or not? It goes very much to the heart of what we're talking about today. Because of the information technology and all the subcontracting uh, um, opportunities that come up under that and all of, uh, all of the, uh, the work-on-demand apps and the, the uh, crowdsourced workers, it's becoming much more plausible to, for employers to try to formulate the relationship in a way that takes them outside of controlled employees, all right? And, and um, so we've ended up with a problem here that, and as Vina pointed out this morning, it can save the employer as much as a third of payroll if they can define this relationship as independent contractors rather than employees. And so they have enormous incentives to do this. And what they do is they sometimes just merely misclassify employees. You have an actual relationship that would ultimately be adjudicated an employee relationship, but they classify them as independent contractors and they don't pay the taxes and and then we end up having to sort that out down the road. The other thing is what's called regulatory arbitrage, which is they, and, and this we see, you talked about the FedEx case, you talked about Uber trying to make changes. What they do is they, they may have a economically efficient relationship, but they change it in order to avoid the regulation. In other words, it's one thing to set up a relationship in an app because it's efficient, but it's another thing to do it because I just want to avoid paying taxes. I want to avoid my responsibilities under the employment laws. And the problem with that, of course, is that that undermines the whole purpose is why government, uh, the society has interceded in this relationship to begin with. There are costs there that we want to mediate between the employer and the employee. We don't want the employee to bear all of it. We want the work relationship itself to bear some of it in the cost of the good. And we definitely don't want society to end up paying for people who don't have adequate unemployment or, or health care or anything else, okay, or wages or whatever, all right? And what, I, what, what Assembly Bill 5 does, I think, is – the simplest solution to the problem. Assembly Bill 5, it adopts the ABC test basically for all state regulation in the state of California. And the reason why this addresses this misclassification problem and this regulatory arbitrage problem the best, I think, is, uh, uh, first of all, a good number of reasons. First of all, I think it meets the, protect, it meets the purpose 
of, of uh, protective legislation the best. In other words, we are, in, in interpreting statutes, we're supposed to look first at the plain language, then we're supposed to look at the legislative history, then we're supposed to look at the purpose, and we're supposed to fulfill the purpose. Control, under the, the traditional control test, doesn't have a lot to do with most protective legislation. Control came out of tort law. It made sense back when we were trying to determine, should this contractor be held liable for what this person did? And if they control them, the answer is yes. But it doesn't have, you know, whether you are controlled or something doesn't have a lot to do with whether or not you should have protection under the minimum wage law or whether or not you should have protection under employment discrimination, things like that. Uh, so, uh, so I think looking at whether the person is not, control, not controlled and not dependent is a better way to meet those purposes. The other thing is that it is broader uh, and it has more certainty, I think, uh, because now, rather than having the burden on the moving party and having this, you know, hodgepodge of, uh, of totality of the circumstances, nothing is determinative, everything can be weighed, we're not sure how they're going to be weighed, you know, the, the claimant may have these arguments, the employer may have these arguments, how is the court going to weigh that? Lots of uncertainty, lots of room for error, lots of rooms for misclassification. With the, with the ABC test, it's the burden is on the employer. We presume they're employees unless you can show all three of these things, and if you can't, they're employees, all right? So get your act together and, and pay taxes on them. Uh, um, and I think that would clarify the situation a lot. It would cast a broader net. It would, it would force the work relationship, not employers, because what will happen is they'll have to raise wages and they'll pass those prices on to the, to, to the customers. Uh, but it will for, it'll force the work relationship to bear the responsibilities of these burdens, which is what society wanted um, to begin with. And it actually... The current situation where we allow some people to kind of sneak out on it through either misclassification or regulatory arbitrage undermines the employers who are being responsible and paying their employment taxes on, on uh, the people that they're working for. And just to leave it as a point where I always come down to when I'm thinking about, about Uber, Uber basically is arguing, if you think about it from society's perspective, uh, uh, Uber keeps track of all these hours. They know how much everybody is paid. They could easily deduct Social Security taxes and send it to the federal government. Rather than do that, they want the federal government to go around and collect Social Security from every one of the 300,000 drivers. It's just crazy uh, what they want people to do. They have, you know, they have, they, uh, from the perspective of Social Security is a basic thing that all working people should have and it should be collected, it should be collected from Uber. There's no, there's no, there's no sense at all in forcing the government to go around and collect it from all those little individual drivers. So uh, I, I, uh, I'm a big uh, supporter in AB5, and I'd like to see uh, more jurisdictions adopt it. Thank you. And thank you, too, Professor Dauschmidt. And Fina? Hello. Thank you all for having me. Um, and thank you, Professor Dubal and Dauschmidt, for those comments. I think my comments will really build on some of the points that um, you two have made in regard to Professor Dauschmidt commenting on like the particularities of the test. And Professor Dubal, I won't speak much about this, maybe unless you ask later about Q&As, but my LLM research is really focused on time in, and the role that plays in decision makers' analysis of employment status. And I think it's um, a really interesting area to probe. Um, but what I was going to focus on for my remarks is comparing California's test with my home jurisdiction in Ontario, uh, in Canada, to kind of get some insights into sort of the strengths and benefits when you look nitty-gritty at the test and what that has to offer. So I'll speak to three different points. First is comparing the actual mechanics of the test. Second, speaking about um, the kind of the interpretive approach and the legal categories we have in both jurisdictions. And then thirdly, I'll speak more from... Uh, my interest in kind of like a feminist labor perspective of like what counts as work and what the employment status test tells us about that. Um, so to the mechanics of the test, so Professor Dauschmidt provided really interesting background about California's test. Both Ontario and California share a similar history in that like the test began in the context of vicarious liability in tort. The, the desire was to compensate third parties who were being harmed by workers' actions and who had the money to pay for it. It was the employer and control in that context made sense as a determinative factor because the employer, the putative employer, could structure the workplace in a way um, that would minimize the risk of a third party being harmed. Um, but so California's moved away from an exclusive focus on control and now 
as Professor Dashmet went over, we start with a presumption of employee status, which is important, and then the three-part ABC test. The first factor speaks to control, but the others to speak to um, whether the worker is outside the usual course of business and if the worker is independently engaged in um, a trade, occupation, or business in the same nature of work. Meanwhile, in contrast, Ontario, um, we still use more of a control-based multi-factor test. Um, well, we have different tests, including a control test, um, an economic reality test, and a business integration test, but the most commonly used test is... Um, uh, it's called the fourfold test. It looks at one, control, two, ownership of tools, three, opportunity to profit, and four, chance of loss. So those latter three factors really go to economic dependency. And depending on the specific context, because um, as you know, the independent contractor employee distinction applies in a range of circumstances. So from collective bargaining to um, employment standards to pensions to occupational health and safety, we're asking the question in a bunch of different contexts, so the factors will differ in Ontario, but the most common are those four factors. Um, and as you said, no one factor uh, is determinative and the weight varies by circumstance. So I guess I'll make two comments in, compa in comparing these tests. One is, I think um, the California test is no doubt more broadly protective, and I think the starting presumption of employee status has a lot to do with that. Um, but second, I would maybe disagree that the Ontario test is so unpredictable, even though it is multifactorial, and that does leave um, something to the discretion of the decision maker. But decision makers are constrained by precedent, and the reason that I kind of feel that it's not as unpredictable as one might think when you think of a balancing test is because there is uh, a piece of AI technology called the Employment Forecaster in Ontario that, like this kind of startup developed, that predicts with like over 90% accuracy and confidence um, a, a worker's employment status. So I think with relevant case law, even if you're using a multifactorial test, it's not necessarily so uncertain. Um, that leads me to my second uh, set of comments about the interpretive approach and the categories in each jurisdiction. So one interesting point is that Ontario has an intermediate category of dependent contractor. So how that works is if you legally, a decision maker arrives at a finding that the person is an independent contractor, but the, on like a fourfold test, but, or a multifactorial test, depending on the circumstance, um, but the economic realities suggest they are dependent on that hiring entity, then they will be treated as an employee. And this has been around since like the 1970s in Ontario. It came out of like a legal scholar sort of idea. He borrowed the idea from Sweden. It also exists in Sweden and Germany and other jurisdictions. Um, and so it exists, it's legislated in the collective bargaining context, and then it's also common law for um, like entitlement to notice, because Ontario is not, does not have at-will employment, so our people are entitled to uh, um, reasonable notice if they're dismissed. Um, but I suggest that this category is quite useful. Um, I'm not sure how, like I, I don't imagine it kind of, I don't know how it would interact with the ABC test, but like in a in where you're where you're using more of a multi-factor test, I think it's quite important. Um, and the reason I say so is because both Ontario and California, our decision makers are supposed to take a purposive approach to interpreting the legislation. So as Professor Dow Schmidt mentioned, this is remedial legislation. It's enacted for a specific purpose. Um, and so in Ontario, we say like you're supposed to take into account, uh, like give a large and liberal interpretation to reflect the remedial purposes. Um, but in fact, I think decision makers often struggle with purposive interpretation because it's not always clear what the purpose of legislation is. And I think that the U.S. is an instructive example. Um, like historically, we began like with, the case, um, with doing more purposive interpretation, but the U.S. Supreme Court, I think in like a national insurance, v. Darden said like, no, unless there's clear specific... I, I, um, there's a clearly expressed intent. Otherwise, then you use the common law test. So I think purposive interpretation is kind of like, it's trickier than it seems, and I think it's often kind of a substitute for, you're shifting the inquiry basically from employment status to like asking decision makers to decide on the purpose of the legislation. So I think the intermediate category really helps with that when the legal test leads you to one place, but the kind of reality suggests another. So when I think about um, what the dependent uh, contractor 
category could do for platform work, for example, I think it could address the fact that like maybe some workers would be treated as employees if they work a certain number of hours for the platform or if that kind of is where they make the m most of their money. Um, and I, I think it would allow for a more contextual determination um, and prevent kind of like being over-inclusive or under-inclusive. Okay, and then finally, I'll make some brief comments about my starting point when I think about employment classification is really like why some things count as employment that's entitled to protections and benefits and other work that's clearly like has social and economic value is not. And there is like a lengthy historical explanation we could go into about policy choices to exclude, um, well, as somebody discussed this morning, like agricultural work and domestic work especially. Um, but I, I think that this is like a really rich time to probe questions about what counts as work. Like, and I think discussions about platform work sort of ignite the discussion, but I'm also interested in bringing in, um, like looking at work traditionally done by women, especially care work, um, but also paid work outside the home and the shared features between the two. So um, both gig economy work and care work tend to be part-time. They're more short-term. Um, I think of them both as interstitial they can sort of like fit in the spaces of your day. Um, and even the way women sort of entered paid employment in the industrial era as men went off to war, it was kind of like filling the spaces. They both also tend to be task-based. Uh, and the nature of the work, um, there's a great deal more like emotional labor that's not easily recognized by law um, in both forms of work. So um, in my own research, I sort of asked questions about how our legal categories can contemplate both kind of on the assumption that they're socially and economically valuable what does that mean for the employment categories that we're using? Thank you. Thank you so much. So since this is the first panel I've ever moderated, uh, this might be a little ambitious, but I'm going to try my best to get a couple questions out to each of our panelists, and we'll just go down the line. And since this is offered for CLE credit, I'm going to try to ask a couple practitioner-based questions once we get through some of these broader social implication-based questions. Um, so just to start off, my first question is for you, Professor Dubois. And you didn't bring it up in your, your presentation, but when I was working through some of your work, you've argued with, that for substantive change to occur in this sphere, that politically integrated litigation is necessary. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit more about that and how that may have an interplay with the typical ambivalent worker? Absolutely. So it's a really, really good, incisive question. Um, let me answer it, and then I would love at some point to talk about the dependent contractor um, mm -hmm. uh, idea, at least in the California context. So, um, you know, a lot of my a lot of my work is on how um, how plaintiffs' attorneys think about. In the class action context, I mean, we don't have class actions anymore, so maybe this is useless. But um, in you know, in a in a pre epic B system, epic systems world, um, you know, plaintiffs' attorneys had these class actions, and looking at how workers' perspectives were integrated into those class actions, um, and how you know consensus was built in making decisions, etc., cetera, et cetera, particularly in the context of impact litigation um, around these particular issues. So. In the FedEx case, in the Alexander v. FedEx case, which is as an example that since I already mentioned the case earlier, um, the plaintiffs talk about how they did never want an employment status. They wanted to be independent contractors. Like unlike maybe um, the Uber drivers where the economic situation and the level of control is so extreme um, that drivers really want to be want these basic benefits on some level. The drivers in the FedEx litigation prior to the litigation said, you know, we really we want we just want FedEx to back off. We want them to stop telling us that we have to wear uniforms. We want them to, uh, them to stop telling us that we have to um, do this particular route. We want them to stop surveilling us with this, you know, GPS technology. They like they really just wanted them to back off, and um, and they were you know really kind of upset about the outcome of the case, even though they won. I mean, really, really distraught. Um, you know, these people ultimately their livelihoods, as I stated said earlier, was um, you know was they were not as um, what happened out of the case was not what what it was intended to have happened, even though they got a lot of a lot of settlement money. And the the lead litigator in the case is Beth Ross was, uh, did, did the multi-state litigation in FedEx is a, you know a dear friend of mine, and she's very very aware of of this like sort of unfortunate outcome. And her 
And she really you know, took the workers' perspectives into this litigation as she was doing it. And one of the things that, she, that has come out of it for her is just that the answer to, these, to this problem does not lie in the court system, that it absolutely must come out of, um, out of regulators. And so, um, and so she right now is also a big part in California based on the FedEx experience of pushing back, um, of pu pushing the AB5 and having regulators enforce the law. Um, and and in, with, with it in mind that workers in this particular industry really need and want the flexibility um, and, and that it's very, very different from, from um, the FedEx context. But then we think about, and I can talk about this later if people are interested, we think about what you know, is, is understood as ghost work, like mechanical Turk work or, um, or you know, uh, the, the different platforms that allow workers to do work for pennies at a piece, you know, piece rate, which is more analogous to women's work. Um, uh, and, you know, par part, of the, part of the critique, the feminist legal critique of how piece rate work was, um, was regulated or not regulated over many, many decades was that all the woman's, all the person's time was not accounted for. It was just, just the piece was accounted for. Um, and so uh, there are ways to sort of, to think, it, to regulate those economies also, those sort of more, um, more independent um, uh, uh, piece, piecework economies with the idea in mind that really all that work should be compensated. You know, the, the work it takes to find the job, the work it takes to, um, to complete the job, the work it takes to communicate with the, um, the employer or the, you know, the requester, the work it takes to make amendments, et cetera, not just the, the, the end result itself. I just, the one point I'd make on that is this, this uh, and I, 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 I'm sure Vina's right that these employees are worried about losing their flexibility, but just having flexible hours, you don't have to be an independent mm -hmm. contractor to have flexible right. hours. Yes. Nobody in the world has more flexible hours than a law professor. I can tell you, I've always, <laughs> I've always been an employee. Yeah. I don't know, you know, this, I can see why the employers say this. Oh, yeah. if they make you employees, yeah. you're going to lose your flexibility. That's absolutely bunk. Yeah. It's, it's one of... Even in the old traditional test, that's one factor among many that we put into this totality of circumstances balancing. And, and under the ABC test, flexibility uh, would, at most, it would win you one of the uh, one of the points. Uh, but but uh, you'd have to win all three of them to get it uh, and, to not be an employee. And to that point, you know, the point that I make have made to regulators is no one wants to be driving around for hours and hours and hours without a ride in their car. Like, that's not flexibility. Workers also want to be incentivized to work during the times that are the busiest. And also, working for 60 to 70 hours a week, just because you get to choose those 60 or 70 hours, is not by definition flexible work. And time discipline didn't just come from, and the labor movement didn't just come from employers. It came from employees. It came from workers who fought for an eight-hour workday so that they could have leisure and luxury. And so uh, the ways in which, absolutely, the ways in which flexibility is being weaponized in this context is really, um, really insidious. Uber, too, as I, I think I've learned, I don't know as much about them, how they do business as Vina does, but recently I think I've learned that um, they actually prohibit people from being online at certain points. In other words, drivers can sign up to do certain hours and they can later on try to see if they can get on, but if they're not signed up ahead of time, they can't work then. So there actually is not as much flexibility in being an Uber driver as they like to have you uh, believe. And, and how, yeah, uh, yeah, I, Well, enough said about that. It's... They, they exercise a fair amount of control over when those people work. Yeah, in my LLM research, I've done a lot of looking at how decision makers think about like flexibility and time and, well, part-time and scheduling, like the when and where you're working. And I think that, I think that the way it's framed in the, as you illustrated really well, I think the way it's framed in the Uber debate is way overblown. Like it's really the decisive, it's not the decisive factor. Like it, it can be an indicia of control, but it's just one. And if it's not central to the business, then it's not make or break in terms of whether you're a worker. So I think there, there's a real divide. Like in the way that question is framed really illustrated it well of like, that's not gonna be determinative of your employment side. It hasn't been in a range of contexts when you look at like other kind of if you workers of um, like hairdressers or like truck drivers or like t taxi drivers in other capacities. Like control over your own time isn't the one thing you give up. A problem that we, we I'm sorry, can I add one more thing? Yeah, go ahead. This? Just because I don't think people are thinking about it, and I think it's actually quite important. One problem that we will find in regulating um, uh, wages 
in this economy is that um, is the issue under under in the FLISA context, but also in, in state uh, wage context of, co of um, compensable time. So. Um, these platform companies are arguing that the time in between when a worker has um, a fare in their car should not be compensated, that that is not, um, that that is not work, um, and so it shouldn't be calculated into, that it's more like a break, and the, um, but even then, like a, a break that shouldn't be compensated, that should be treated as on, you know, potentially on call time. And the uh, the law in California, which very much, I think, reflects um, the FLISA standard is, you know, who, for whom is that time, does that time benefit? And so it's like a, literally like a 50 plus uh, analysis. Like if, if a worker, if a worker can use that time and the prototypical example is like to study their GRE um, books, then which is like so frustrating, like such a disconnect from what these workers' lives are like. But if they could use that time for their own benefit, um, then they, then it doesn't have to be compensated. Um, and so Uber, the argument that plaintiff's attorneys have said is that because Uber and Lyft deactivate workers who decline the next call or decline the next fare, they, um, that time is, is actually for Uber, that it most benefits Uber. So brilliantly, in response to this, um, Uber recently in California changed their, not anywhere else, but in California changed, the regula changed their internal regulations such that you can um, decline fares without, um, without fearing deactivation. So it really sort of shifts the burden uh, or shifts the uh, shifts potentially shifts the legal analysis so that they don't have to pay for um, pay for that pay for that downtime and so and and so like regulators have been saying oh you know or the plaintiffs attorneys and regulators have been like oh well then we have to um, use this utilization rate that we that they figured out in California or in New York City and I was like you know what all you got to do is write a wage order say this is compensable time. And, and it's compensable time. Like we can regulate around these things. Like these business models are not inevitable. I'm going to turn to to Leanne next. You had mentioned a little bit that there, you know, there's there's different ways to value productive activity, mm -hmm. and specifically in the context of your research, it's the relationship between productive activity and gender. How do you see these uh, feminist conception of labor? How do you see that these legal tests could be used to to value productive activity and to explore it further? Yeah, well, my focus for my research has been on time because, like, I think that, um, like, sort of our labor and employment law is developed in the context of, like, a wage contract, so you exchange time for wages, and, like, time is kind of a proxy for labor. And in a way, there's, like, a fairness to that. Like, we all have time to spend. Um, and in the standard employment relationship, like, that makes a lot of sense. If you spend your full day at the factory producing, like, widgets or whatever, then you're paid for a full time, full day's work. It doesn't, and that's kind of like the context in which our labor and employment laws were developed and why like it doesn't suit the world of work today. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about time because I see a lot of arguments from feminist legal scholars and others coalescing around the idea of like the need for a compressed work week, um, the need for like better part-time work that's like treated equally to full-time work. Um, the need for like more equality between people who are like spending way too much time working and people who are underemployed. Um, and I kind of see all these, so I'm sort of interested in like, well, take it like, given that we use the independent contractor employee test, like can it do the work we need to take into account like other ways that people could arrange their time to like, so that we can like advance equality. That's basically kind of the premise for my question. And I'm still in the midst of my research, but I do find that, um, like time is not the main factor. And I think if we couple kind of like control and economic dependency, you can get away from the idea that like a person could be spending their time doing other things. But of course, then you need to think about the broader social context and like, do they have enough um, like, like financial support to like be doing other things with their time? So you have to think about like things like, like universal basic income or like other policies to ensure that people can like meet their basic needs while also diversifying how they spend their time. And then I guess my final kind of social equality oriented question is going to be for Professor Dauschmidt. Uh, Professor Duval earlier talked a little bit about the organizing that happened around the taxi industry in San Francisco. What are some of the broader implications for new laws like AB5 for organized labor? Is there, are there new movements coming across the country? What, what, what should we, we, we should be watching out for? 
Well, in, in terms of organization, I, I mean, uh, at least in the private sector, they're governed by the National Labor Relations Act, and that won't be controlled by AB5, and that can't be controlled at the state level. That would have to be, you'd have to have an amendment at the, and, and the National Labor Relations Act is clearly under the right to control test now. Congress did that in the Taft-Hartley amendments that were talked about earlier this morning. Uh, uh, so that would have to be amended at the national level. You could, there is an argument that, um, uh, uh, if they are not employees under the National Labor Relations Act, then the, then the state can regulate them. So theoretically, uh, California could pass a law that says, uh, you know, people who aren't employees under the National Labor Relations Act are governed by this, this collective bargaining law. And there's been some effort to do that. Um, uh, the other way, uh, uh, Vina talked about some people wanted to go forward with these people as independent contractors. Independent contractors are clearly excluded from the National Labor Relations Act, and in order to get them exempted from the antitrust laws, some local governments and some state governments have talked about having collective bargaining for independent contractors. And there's an argument there about whether the, the National Labor Relations Act preempts that or whether they actually could do that. Uh, um, so. Uh, it, it's a it's a tough issue there. I, I still think um, even if they can't organize in formal unions for collective bargaining, they have enough collective interests together that you. I still think you will see political movements among these drivers. Uh, where they, as Vina was pointing out, a lot of their the taxi drivers' success was in through lobbying local local governments and state governments, and and there are obstacles to that now if they if they regulate them at the state level, as she pointed out, but that there still is a room for collective action in the political sphere for these people, so. And notice that if you don't have a union that's doing this organizing and then drivers are doing the organizing themselves, the antitrust liability fears, risks go way down because uh -huh. these drivers have no money. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So in the interest of time, I'm going to save my last question for the very end. I want, I want it to be kind of a parting thought experiment, but I will open it up for the audience if there are any questions at this time. Labor stood really firmly against the idea of a third category in California. And um, the risk that, um, that they saw was that, well, it's exactly what the companies wanted. Um, it's precisely what they wanted. And it's really for them about avoiding unionization. So Ken, you asked this question this morning, like, you know, it seems like they could, um, they could just do this and, and still make money. And I, and I think, you know, Another answer to that question is that they want to avoid unionization at all costs. So the kinds of dependent contractor things that they were proposing, even though, like, and so, and I did, I mean, I, I've looked at all of all of the various things that were floating around. Um, even though in some of their um, suggested legislation, they said, okay, well, the Ninth Circuit in this um, in this Chamber of Commerce case gave us a roadmap for how to do. Um, bar to do collective bargaining at the state level in California. Um, and they sort of use that to say, look, we'll allow, we'll give some union um, the power to organize this sector or to have association rights in this sector um, through contract with us. But the, but the devil was in the details. And this is also my answer. I don't know if you've been hearing all of this like discussion about sectoral bargaining and ho how we need sectoral bargaining in this country. I mean, sectoral bargaining is great. It's multi-state uh, employment bargaining, but the devil is in the details. If it is not an independent um, union or association or group, then the likelihood that it's actually going to benefit workers in the same way that you know the NLRA can at, a, at, a, at the federal level is, is much lower. And so the types of things that they were seeking and the things that they were willing to compromise on were they didn't want to bargain over wages. Um, they didn't want to bargain over um, like they did not want to give into the idea that workers would need overtime. They did not want. They wanted to provide, provide portable benefits instead of um, workers' compensation and unemployment insurance. I mean, they were just led. They were they were using this idea of a third category to just 
um, to really lower standards and labor standards more broadly. And then the fear on behalf, particularly in the service economy, like in the building trades, in the, uh, in the construction workers' unions, was like, well, our work can be appified like this. We have unions right now, and what's going to happen if we have this third category is that all of our, co look, all of our companies are going to become handy, and we're going to use the la lose the labor power that we have. Labor standards are going to go way down. This isn't just about Uber and Lyft. This is about you know the service work more broadly. Um, and so you know, I, I think that there are perhaps scenarios where we could think of um, protective benefits for workers who are not clearly employees or independent contractors, but the platform-based gig, gig economy is certainly not that place. So I said I was going to save this question for last. Are there any other, anyone else in the audience? Okay. So we have practitioners in the audience. We have law students in the audience. And this, like I said, is the Indiana Journal of Law and Social Equality Symposium. So in a kind of a rapid-fire fashion, this can't be a long answer. What is one thing, even the first thing, that you all, after talk, we, uh, this fantastic talk, do you think that lawyers and future lawyers can do to advance social equality and employment? Uh, I always tell my, um, my employment law class and labor law class that when you go in-house in Silicon Valley, because I'm in San Francisco, you <laughs> push back against these ideas. Your job is not just to um, just to serve the material interests of the of the company, but also to create um, potentially create. You know, it was lawyers that created the independent contractor carve out. It was lawyers that that that. In, I mean, I can tell you the lawyer in the taxi industry who um, who decided to use this carve out in the NLRA to de to deunionize the, the industry, and it's had these sort of devastating long term effects. And so, I um, I, I think that just. If, especially if people are going to go in-house or if they're going to do defense work, they really can think about the, the impact that their work is going to have on, on the people that they're ultimately going to be reaching. I would say we have to find ways either through traditional organizing or political organizing or works councils or something. We have to get employees' voices in the workplace and in the state legislature represented again. And I, I think it's an enormous problem not only for our economy but also for our democracy. Uh, the fact that the working class right now is the loose cannon rolling back and forth on the deck of the ship of state is very disturbing, and it, and it could go either way. And, and, and we've already seen that, that uh, the results may not be good uh, uh, um, with Trump as president. So, uh, so I, I, I think, and I, I think it's, it's, it's an, these people are not going to disappear. Their jobs may disappear overseas, although it disturbs me a little bit that I hear G service industries who have no threat from overseas competition at all are still vehemently, we can't have employee organization under any circumstances. I mean, that's just about greed and control is all that's about. They're not being threatened by overseas wages or things like that. Uh, 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 we have to have some organization for the benefit of both those workers and their wages and our economy, and also just for the benefit of our democracy. These people have to be organized somehow. I'll say two things quickly. One is just the concept of like decent work, which is like sort of setting a floor for no one should kind of be participating in work and have their kind of efforts fall such that they're not their conditions below a certain level. Um, but the second point is a point you made to me yesterday, Aaron, about um, like your plans to work for an employment, um, an employer side, doing employer side labor work, but that you emphasize the need for strong unions in order to be able to do your job properly. And I think that's a really powerful concept that like you need both sides um, protected in order to like ensure decent, decent conditions for everybody. This has just been a fantastic hour. Please join me in thanking our panel for this great talk. <laughs>